Do you want to be able to get blazing fast internet anywhere? Do you want to be able to work from anywhere? How about gaming? Maybe streaming 4K video? Or perhaps you just want to be able to stay connected to family and friends while you're traveling around the country and you want to have a system that's extremely reliable. Well, stick around because in this video, I'm going to tell you about the best mobile internet setup to be able to do all those things and more. Now, before we get into the hardware, let's quickly talk about service plans. I have tried all of the major cellular carrier providers. I've tried AT&T, Verizon, and T-Mobile. And T-Mobile just simply doesn't work everywhere uh, compared to AT&T and Verizon, which generally speaking, work almost everywhere. So, you know, I've also tried the different plans from those carriers, like prepaid versus postpaid. I've tried things like visible and compared that to regular Verizon. And what I can tell you is that those third-party plans, as well as the prepaid plans from the carriers themselves, they're just deprioritized. And so what that means is if you're in an area where the tower is super congested and there's somebody around there like me who's on a different plan, they may have a higher priority than you. And if they're using a lot of data, there's really gonna be nothing left for those people who are last. And yes, you still do get some connectivity, but ultimately it's just much slower. And so having a postpaid plan with premium data ultimately is gonna guarantee that you're gonna get X amount of high performance data all the time. And so I'm using Verizon and I have a Verizon cell phone, and so I have a hotspot add-on plan that's 50 gigs that I use with the router, and that works just fine. I also have an AT&T hotspot plan, and that one is just kind of standalone. That one's a little bit unique. It's actually a truly unlimited plan that enables me to get premium data, unlimited, and so I really do take advantage of that in one specific way on my TV. All of that streaming that you would be doing, watching HD videos, um, is going to consume you know hundreds of gigabytes a month if you're using it all the time and so i've got the router set up in a specific way that makes all of the connections for the streaming go out over at t so i can just use as much data all the time and really not be worried about streaming then you know i've also got uh, Starlink and you might be wondering well why need why do you need Starlink when you've got Verizon and, and at t uh, I'll tell you is because Starlink just goes beyond where those places go. Um, there's some certain spots where if you're in a national park or you go you know, down a certain road far enough, you'll go past where there's cellular coverage. And you know, I don't want to have to worry about going back to civilization just because I have to be able to get on the internet. And I really need to be able to get on the internet. And so having that ability to connect to Starlink anywhere is absolutely priceless and I think it kind of uh, enables me to really truly go anywhere and not really have to worry about connectivity. That said, I only use Starlink in those situations where the cellular connectivity isn't working because it really is fast enough all the time that plugging in the Starlink might give me slightly faster speed tests. I'm just not using that much bandwidth continuously to truly justify hooking up the Starlink all the time. Right now, it is something that I have to take up and down off the roof. And so, you know, with a minute or two of setup, uh, it's just not something that I, you know, need to do. I'm gonna jump into a diagram here and just quickly talk you through the components. I think this is much easier for me to explain it this way instead of standing out by the van and pointing at things and you're not really gonna understand how it all fits together because some of these things just don't fit in one view. So in the center here, this is my core router. It's a Peplink Max BR2 Pro 5G. You can see I've got things kind of separated here into WAN and LAN. On the WAN side, I've got multiple internet connections. And so these WANs are really just independent internet circuits. And there are two cellular connections built in, two, two cellular modems, they're 5G. Uh, and then there's also two Ethernet ports here, and those can connect to anything with an Ethernet port. There's also a USB plug here, which you can plug in a USB Ethernet dongle or another 5G modem, so you could add on basically another interface. I'm not using that right now, but that's basically for some potential future expansion that I may have at some point in the future where I need seven WANs in the, in, in the van. 
Lastly, there's there's also um, you know kind of this Wi-Fi connection in terms of also having not only cellular. Um, I also have you know um, Wi-Fi. It's got a wireless chipset built in, so you get the cellular connections, Wi-Fi, internet connections, Ethernet connections. So it's it's kind of this blended thing that enables you to take all of those types of different connections and bring them into one box. Before I get into all of those internet circuits, I'm going to quickly talk about the, the LAN side, so my clients. There's four Ethernet ports, and I'm using two of those right now. One is for my streaming TV, and I use an Ethernet cable for this. It does support Wi-Fi, but you know, Wi-Fi, even with my setup here, can it sometimes be unreliable. Maybe the device itself just struggles to maintain a solid Wi-Fi connection. Or, you know, the Wi-Fi in the area is uh, experiencing a lot of interference, potentially. And so, you know, it can disconnect or create a blip. And that can sometimes cause these streaming applications to lose their connection momentarily. Some of those don't really handle that that well. Netflix does a pretty good job. Uh, but some of those other applications, they basically conk out and you have to kind of relaunch the app, find that movie you were watching, hope that it remembered where you were at. So I get basically more reliable streaming and casting by having the TV connected to an Ethernet jack and cable. The other connection here, you can see the um, this is plugged into a power over Ethernet injector, which then flows to a wireless access point that sits up on the roof, kind of directly in the center of the van there. Uh, I'm doing this because there's the wireless that's built in, which I'm using for the upstream connections. And so I want to have some separation there so they're not conflicting with each other. And within this access point, I've got it set up for two SSIDs. This I do specifically to ensure that the devices, you know, they don't get confused with figuring out which frequency they should be on. So there's a separate 2.4 gigahertz SSID and then another one for 5 gigahertz. The devices that support both, like I said, sometimes get confused and having a unique one for each. The devices that support five gigahertz, I only set those ones up with the SSID information for the five gigahertz, and that just make, makes them work better. Now, I do have some devices that do support both that I may at some times use, like my cell phone or a laptop. Sometimes I'm doing things and I might go far enough away from the van where I want to be able to, you know, get on the van internet because there's no internet around that area or spot. And so uh, using the, you know, settings in my phone, I basically set up the 2.4 gigahertz on that to be not auto connect. So when I'm near the van, my phone or my laptops will automatically connect to five gigahertz, but they also have the ability if I need to, to just quickly touch the button and join the other one. All the other stuff, like I said, other than the TV uses Wi-Fi, like the Alexa, the Echo Dot, um, the smart plugs and the lighting and you know anything else, the temperature sensors and so on. Uh, I don't expect to ever actually need these other ethernet jacks. However, it's nice to have them there in the potential need for in the future. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you now about the WAN side of this. There's a lot going on here. And so I'm gonna start uh, primarily with the what I use all the time. And so for regular day-to-day -day use all the time, I'm really leveraging Verizon and AT&T as the only solution. And so as I'm driving around, I'm able to be connected to both of those all the time. I have these two MIMO roof-mounted antennas from Panorama. Each one of these has multiple antennas packed into that little dome. And so the one on the right here has four antennas in it, and the one on the left here has six antennas in it. The, this one, you know, this one on the left here um, has Wi-Fi antennas, and how I use that is to be able to pick up free Wi-Fi at places like National Park Visitor Centers, also at state parks, there's campgrounds with free Wi-Fi, and then also because in my home here I have Xfinity, they have something called Xfinity Wi-Fi, which basically is the ability for you to put some credentials in, a, in your laptop or your phone and then be away from your home and connect to Wi-Fi. And uh, I don't really use that on my phone. I use that within the router itself. So I've programmed it with the Xfinity information to be able to connect to that. And so in my driveway, it's actually picking up 
from the neighborhood, somebody who has Xfinity. Uh, it also picks it up when I go down to the beach. It picks it up when I go to the grocery store. Any, you know, it's random places all over. These Xfinity wireless hotspots are just there. And so I have it set up to just connect to them and I don't really have to think about it. And how that benefits me is, you know, in those situations where maybe I'm having slow performance with either one of these connections, having that additional uh, capacity gives me just more performance. Or if let's say I'm in a spot where like in Kings Canyon, there's just Verizon. So there's no AT&T there and the Verizon signal is still pretty slow. And so there's a visitor center where I'm able to get on the free visitor center Wi-Fi and beyond Verizon at the same time and get still that performance and capacity of two connections sandwiched into one. Okay, I'm gonna quickly jump over here to the Starlink. You'll see here, I've got the Starlink dish on this little base. I actually have it typically mounted on the roof on just the standard uh, flip up bracket that you can buy on the Starlink store. And it's bolted into the roof rack and I take that up and down as needed. Again, because I have really good connectivity with the Verizon and the AT&T, there's no need for me to pop this out everywhere I go. I really only deploy it when I'm in a spot where there's poor coverage or no coverage, or sometimes if you're in certain campgrounds, it can get really congested at night. And so I might be getting decent signal and, and also decent service with Verizon and AT&T, but sometimes even with that, you know, I want to have more capacity and so I'll deploy the Starlink and just get the capacity of all three of those simultaneously. You'll see here I'm not using the Starlink dish, or sorry, the Starlink router, uh, that white box that comes with it for a couple of reasons. One is it runs off of AC power. That's less efficient. You're doing this conversion back and forth where you're taking DC power into AC back to DC and so you lose a lot of power the efficiency and your batteries are just going to run down quicker. Also, having another router in the mix for me doesn't do anything. It just adds more complexity. It's another thing I have to manage and maintain. And their router really isn't that good. So I don't want to have that in here, so I don't have it. I've got the 75 foot cable that enables me to, if I need to, deploy it out on the, on the base and be away from any sort of obstructions. And then I have this Starlink Ethernet dongle that I've customized and cut the end off so this connector that comes with that ethernet dongle can be plugged directly into this PoE injector. So I'm powering the dish using my standard battery. So my DC power, I have this thing in here called the buck boost, which takes 12 volt power, raises it to 48 volt and inserts that power into the cable so that the dish can be powered using my vans, just regular DC power. That that ethernet cable then feeds out into one of these ethernet ports. And so, you know, I get that uh, ethernet connectivity. Again, I'm not using Wi-Fi to connect to the, the Starlink uh, router. All right, last but not least, you might see I've got another Max BR1 Pro 5G. Why would I have an, a third 5G modem if I'm not really using it all the time? Well, I had that before I had this device. So I had two of those kind of set up in a pair it was, it was okay, but it added some complexity, managing two devices as one, and then there were some limitations in terms of using all the interfaces. So I have that still, right, because I upgraded to this device and I still have this other one. And so I'm using this in conjunction with a directional antenna on a mast. And so I've got this device mounted in a spot that's really close to the back door where I can plug in this 16 foot cable that runs up the mast on the directional antenna. And you know, what I would do is I would basically, whichever carrier was not performing or, or was not available, I would just take that SIM card out and I would plug it into this device, which would then take my connection, you know, cellular onto this device and I just bridge that in. And so functionally speaking, at the end of the day, uh, I'm moving the SIM card over into the other device, but for all the clients that use that and because of the router, it just uses it and just kind of puts it again into the mix in something that can be used in terms of bandwidth. The, this, you know, does give me better performance than the Omni antennas. The Omni antennas are gonna go in a circular pattern. So that's really good to have on all the time. You would not wanna have just a directional antenna because as you're driving around, 
you're going to have to repoint it to wherever you think the tower is at. And, you know, it may not even work correctly if you're trying to use this while you're driving down the road. And so you need to have omni antennas because when you're moving around, you know, you want to not have to worry about that. So when I park the van at any spot, I get really the same signal level having these mounted on the roof where they have clear line of sight in 360 degrees. So this directional antenna obviously points only in one direction. It does go further in that one direction. And also your upload is going to be pointed directly in that one direction. Instead of the omni antenna sending your signals back out in every other direction, you're gonna get your transmissions sent directly back to the tower. So while this while this typically will also boost my upload speed, sorry, my download speeds, it has just a way more dramatic increase on the upload speeds. For instance, it might take something that's only giving you one megabit upload and make you get 20 megabits or even more. And so this can be significant. So I, again, I have this as a backup solution. I only deploy that as necessary. I've really only used it a handful of times. Last year I was in Yellowstone was one of those. I was in this camp spot back in the woods and, and it was really wooded. And so I was getting decent signal with the standard roof antennas, but I was parked. I wanted to test it out. And so I got better signal. And so, you know, that's what I was doing at that one spot. Most other places that I was at in the last year, I've not needed this. Uh, and you know, the other thing is Starlink, it doesn't necessarily work in those wood, wooded locations uh, in certain spots, even with the extension cable and moving it away and putting it on the base, you could have too many trees. You really need to have those uh, clear line of sight. And so that's an important point when I'm driving the van to wherever I'm gonna park for the night and I think I'm gonna to need to use the Starlink, I definitely take that into account and I'll try to park the van in a spot where, you know, I think I'm gonna have no obstructions. So, you know, it's just something that now that I have the Starlink, I'm definitely thinking about when I'm parking the. All right, one last thing in this diagram, you might be wondering what's this thing called Fusion Hub? Well, I'll tell you, with this router, like I said, it takes all of these connections and combines them into one, gives you all of that performance combined, and also kind of that failover. So if one of these connections goes down, all of the other ones, you just fail over to that. And generally speaking, for failover purpose, that can be fine. However, if you're doing things like you're on a video call or you're playing a game or you're um, kind of sending an upload, if you actually are kind of getting sent to one of these connections and that one connection fails, well, what will happen is that one session that was going out through that connection, that particular connection, that's gonna fail. And yeah, your client typically will reconnect, Zoom will reconnect, but for a period of time, you're gonna be disconnected from that Zoom. Um, you know, for me, I do a lot of Zoom presentations and if I get disconnected while I'm presenting, that can be really disruptive to any meeting. And so when I'm connected to Zoom, I'm using this Fusion VPN connection and all of my Zoom traffic will go out through this VPN connection in a way that if one of those connections fails, nothing happens to that Zoom session. That Zoom call stays connected. Sometimes I do see something on the screen that indicates that my connection is quote unquote unreliable, but like I said, it doesn't actually disconnect me or cause it to reconnect. So that's super important. Another thing that this enables me to do is because all of these connections typically, you know, they're just a consumer connection they don't give you a static IP address. And for me and my work, I actually need to have that because certain things that I have to be able to get into, they're firewalled off and they don't allow just anything to get into them. And so there are uh, places where you can run a Fusion Hub. And so I have a Fusion Hub that runs in a data center in Silicon Valley and that virtual machine that this thing runs on has a static IP address. And so when I'm connecting to those specific things that require the static IP address, I have all of those set to route through this Fusion Hub in a way where those sessions go to the Fusion Hub and then they go out from the Fusion Hub. And so they appear to actually have originated at the Fusion Hub. And so 
much like those other VPNs that you may have heard of that can, you know, protect your identity and all of that stuff online, your browsing traffic by masking what IP address you're coming from. That also kind of does this for me. All of my traffic appears to come from that address when I'm using it. Um, it can be kind of um, good and bad in some situations. Uh, if you're using an application where it's detecting your physical location based upon that IP address, it's gonna think I'm in Silicon Valley. You know, that can be quickly, typically overridden in those apps. Say I'm actually in, you know, uh, California in some other place, right? And, you know, you then tell it where you're at and you just overcome that. But just be forewarned, if you're using the Fusion Hub VPN, you will appear to come from that location of wherever that internet or website thinks that that address is at. All right, so that's kind of the high level ins and outs of how I use all these different things and how they fit together. So I'm gonna take you next out to the van and I'm gonna show you how I connect the Starlink, how all the stuff plugs in together, the mast and some of that other things. So this is the bin that I keep the Starlink dish in and you can see kind of how big it is. Uh, it's, not, <clears throat> it's not too big, it actually fits it just perfectly when it's in the stow position. So what, did I, what I have in here are some cable clamps that I use to secure the wire to the outside of the van when it's windy and stuff that keeps the cable from hitting against the van and making noise. And it also keeps it from uh, dangling by the door. This is the 75 foot cable. I've got these little plastic covers that are 3D printed. I found those on Etsy. So no dirt and sand and other things. Dirt and sand and other things gets in this and then you might not be able to get connected. So there's a square one for that end. And then the other stuff inside here is I've got some towels just to keep it protected and from sliding around in there, bouncing around. This is the base. Here are these towels, move those. And so when it's in the stowed position, you can see here that it fits basically perfect to the top of that and just inside this bin. Have another towel underneath there, microfiber fleecy thing. So this is the dish and the one end goes in here of the cable and then the other end goes in on the back. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you how I set up the Starlink dish onto the roof. As you can see, I've got this uh, antenna holder here that's basically the roof mount for standard Starlink and I've already uh, twisted that uh, little dial there to loosen it and then I put it straight up and then tighten it back down I've already got the Starlink dish out here, so I'm ready to go and Really the first step is to put this put this into here so that I can uh, Drop it into that pipe on the, on the roof there Kind of got my finger caught there a little bit, but it's all right. And I've got these clamps here. So get one of these clamps and then I clamp that in just like that and put a couple more out here. One right there. And then a third one I put just right above the door there. So it's secure above the end of the door. This is the topper rack, just the standard ladder rack. You can find it online and uh, you could set up your stuff this way if you wanted. All right, so get a couple more of these clamps and then open, close the door. Make sure that's not dragging in the dirt and see how I close that and make sure Nothing is getting caught. And go around the back. And put these in my pocket. I only need one to start with. 
And they put one right here and make sure that the wire isn't down below the door there. That's plenty tight. And then the other clamps I use right here on this uh, hinge and then another one here on this hinge that I'll put in at the end. So make sure that my swing is open and then go ahead, make sure the door is unlocked. And then as I put this over and under here, just like that, and making sure that it's also not getting caught in the top when you open and close that is important. And it comes in kind of right here. There's this rubber gasket that is able to handle that width of the wire. And when I close it, it doesn't pinch it too bad. And when you then have it in there for a while and you open it back up, you'll see that the wire is kind of pinched, but uh, you know, it's, it's been okay with, with me doing this uh, so far. Just like that. Put these other clamps on here. Just like that. These are important because of the wind. Keeps it from hitting up against your van all night in the wind. You don't want to have those sounds. Okay, here we are at the back of the van. I've got the cable already brought back to this point and the spot where it runs through the door when I close it on the door is just right here. Uh, when I run it through, what I do is I make sure that I also bring it up and over like this. And this I think is important to do because if there's rain coming down that cable, you don't want this cable to actually be sloped downward into the van because what can happen is if there was, was to be water uh, coming through that cable, it would have a, a path down. And so by having the cable kind of go into the van and then upward, it helps to minimize or mitigate the issue and, and hopefully then water won't come in via this cable. So it comes up and over and in like that and I just kind of hang it over that and that gives it that upward uh, angle. And on this end, there is the standard Starlink connector. And so for right now, what I'm using is this uh, customized version of the Starlink ethernet adapter. You can see with this red end, I cut the end off of the standard adapter and I did this to enable me to have this, this connector that I can just plug in like that and be able to, um, you know, have the standard connector in such a way that if I had to actually plug in the Starlink router, which I keep in a bin inside here, I could do that. I've only had this now for about six months and when I first set this up last August, I was kind of in a rush and I needed to have something that would work with DC power as my primary solution. But in the event that during a really long road trip, I was experiencing potentially an issue that I couldn't work around and maybe I needed to contact support. The idea was to be able to keep this standard connector end here uh, and then have the other uh, router that I could plug that into just in case maybe Starlink forces you to be plugged into their router to get some sort of update or something like that. I wasn't really sure. Ultimately, I'm gonna get rid of this, um, this adapter and I'm gonna cut the end off of this cable and I'm gonna run it through along the roof line and then over and down with the rest of the LTE antennas. And then I'll put a standard RJ45 connector onto that, which will then run into this and then that will just be permanently connected all the time. And then up on the roof, I'll have uh, the end such that I can plug the Starlink dish into that. And then I'll have kind of a, a, a spool of wire there that I'll need to keep uh, secure so that it doesn't fly off. But um, that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Or potentially, potentially what I may do uh, is also just cut that cable to length and then have a second cable uh, in, inside here in the event that I actually wanted to go some distance away from the van, you know, maybe I just do this solution again. 
uh, because quite honestly, since I've been using it with the setup on the roof, I've never actually used that other base thing in there to be able to put it some distance away from the van. Generally, when I'm parking somewhere and I'm thinking that I might have to use the Starlink, I'm trying to avoid those obstructions before I park the van so that I don't really have to have the Starlink be away from the van. Uh, this is also a benefit for the fact that if I was parked somewhere and I needed to drive away quickly, you know, because when you're parked out in the middle of no, uh, nowhere, you don't know if some shady person comes by and you need to get out of there quickly. Uh, I don't want to have to be able to have to go out of the van, pick up the Starlink off the ground, get it back in the van and then drive away. I can actually drive around campgrounds and stuff like this with the Starlink up and on the roof. Maybe you could drive even a couple of miles down the road, but I wouldn't advise that because that um, that bolt, you know, the, the roof adapter and, and how I have it attached there isn't necessarily secure enough, uh, I think, to be able to handle like 80 miles per hour down the highway. And so I don't do that. I only have used it while driving, you know, like I said, a couple of miles at, you know, 30 miles per hour or less. So. Here we go, when I plug this in, it will activate and power up that on the roof. And essentially I go ahead and close the doors at that point because now I have brought the connection in here. And from that point on, I'm able to do and see everything that's happening on the dish from inside the vehicle. I don't need to be back here to do anything else. Uh, one, uh, one other kind of positive thing uh, about this current setup and the way I have this cable in here is that I'm actually able to reach this uh, from underneath the bed here pretty easily as opposed to having to reach my arm back here. And so at night when I know I'm going to be asleep and I don't need internet access, I actually unplug this because I don't want that 30 watts of continuous consumption drawing down my battery. Okay, here we are at the back of the van. I'm going to show you how I get up the cellular mass and how I attach to the rack. So for purposes of this video, I just kind of got the mast in over here on the left, but normally it would go over in this area and it would be kind of wedged in there in a way that uh, kind of fit in there with the rest of the bag chairs and tables and stuff. So this is the mast and it's 16 foot pole. I got it on Amazon. It's just a standard flag pole. The antenna, it's a pointing X pole V3. And the mount that I have used to attach it to this pole is not the one that came with it. The one that came with it was kind of bulky. So I found this other one on Amazon and it's designed to hold a camera on a pole. So um, it is more compact and it works with the pole. There's some little connectors to keep the end protected. First thing I do is I plug in the connectors. It's a it's a 5G modem, which requires all four ports to be connected to get the full maximum 5G signal. But actually this modem is able to do really like category 18, I think, uh, or category 16, which is super fast with just two ports connected. And this is a 5G ready modem, sorry, antenna. So basically I'm able to get connected to the 5G bands, but I might not be able to get the full absolute rated speed. However, in the scenarios where I'm using this, typically there's no 5G signals and I'm at like one or two bars. So this is, this is going to make it dramatically better. And even if I was to have, you know, let's say two of these and have four ports connected, it likely wouldn't be, you know, that much faster. That would just be a hassle. So two works perfectly. And I plug these into port A and port D. And I have the modem set up to use just ports A and D. There's a setting you got to turn on in the modem. And it's got these plastic clips here on the outside that makes it easy to get these on okay, relatively easily. So I make sure that's tight and then I kind of fit it over here and I'm gonna just tuck this out of the way and so just like the Starlink that I bring in through the other side and that uh, rubber gasket I'm bringing in this LTE antenna connection cable through just that rubber channel 
because I have to take this up and take it down. Uh, you know, it's not permanent and this, this works just fine. So make sure it's not also tugging on that uh, in a way that it's taunt. So I've got a little bit of slack back here and then I get it just up into that spot right there. Close the door, close this door, swing back this, watch out for that. Okay, so now what I do is I attach it, you can attach this to a fence post or a picnic table or something that's nearby. Um, you know, because obviously I've got the bike rack here and it's pretty sturdy, I just use this. Anytime I've needed to use this, I've used just the bike rack. So I've got a little loop here just to be able to get this in here, show for this video. But yeah, I would put it over right here on this side because it's closer so I get more up and down. And the uh, way it goes up and down is you just kind of twist it. And once you twist it, uh, it makes this move freely. So I twist that and get that section and then you just twist it and it twist locks again. And then get another section up, you know, depending upon how high I wanna go or where I'm at, I can take it to the full 16 feet. Make sure it's not jammed in here. It's actually jammed into the rack there. I'm not gonna get to the full 16 feet. It's stuck in the bike rack here, which isn't good, but uh, you see how it works. And then, you know, once that's set, um, basically I'll put on some more Velcro straps. And one other thing that I've done to keep it from having uh, motion and stuff like that is I've got a bottle of antifreeze that I keep in here for emergencies and I have some extra Velcro straps that I basically just put that one gallon of antifreeze at the base of this pole, and then I uh, use those um, straps to secure it to that, and that just gives it a little bit of extra rigidity. It's not gonna move as much. And so just like that, I can bring that back down. So it's not that hard to put it up and take it down, but honestly, with the setup on the roof, um, this hasn't really been something that I've needed to use very often. But I have it as an option, which is really what I wanted, was just having that you know ultimate setup. And when I go to places that are even further out in the wilderness, I'm sure this is definitely gonna be something that I leverage that will absolutely come in handy, and it's gonna be a lifesaver when I got it. If any of this was confusing to you or you still have questions, by all means, just put a comment down in the comment box and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If you like this video, be sure to hit that like and subscribe button down below. Thanks.